My name is Janet Ballard. I work at Indiana University at the Early Childhood Center at the Indiana Institute on Disability and Community. I am a certified zero to three trainer for the Growing Brain training series. Here at the Early Childhood Center, we like to link our trainings to recommended practices with research behind them. We use the DEC recommended practices to achieve this in first steps trainings. A link to the entire list of practices is available in the reference section of this webinar near the end of this presentation. Here are the learning objectives for this training. We will learn the parts of the brain and their functions, understand how nerve cells communicate and connect, and understand neuroplasticity and the role of early experiences in making connections between areas of the brain. Babies are already born with so many amazing abilities. Ability to quickly recognize their parents' voice, recognize their home language, and begin to build a relationship with family members from day one. So much important work has taken place in the newborn's brain during the prenatal period. Let's start by thinking about how big the brain is at birth. So here's the approximate weight of a newborn's brain and the weight of an adult brain. The brain goes through an incredible amount of physical growth between the time a child is born and adulthood. Most of this growth in size and density takes place in early childhood. In the first three months, a brain reaches more than half of adult brain volume. By age one, a child's brain is about two pounds, nearly two thirds its adult size. By the time a child is six years old, the brain is almost fully grown, weighing in at almost three pounds and about 95% of its adult size. Does this mean a six year old's brain has the functionality of an adult brain? Of course not. Size is just one way the human brain grows. It also grows in connectivity. It is the connectivity between the brain cells that allows children to use their brains to their full capacity. These connections are established through loving, positive experiences young children have with their parents or caregivers. Understanding the rapid pace of brain development in the first few years of life helps ground us in how important the roles parents and professionals play in ensuring children receive the loving, positive experiences they need for healthy development. Let's begin by talking about the role of the brain and learn about its parts and their functions. As we talk about the different parts of the brain and their functions, it is important to remember that the brain functions via neural networks. In other words, there is no single brain area that is the emotion center of the brain. Rather, there are many areas that influence our feelings. The same can be said for memory. No one area of the brain, rather there are many brain regions that affect how we store memories and later retrieve them. As development unfolds, these networks become better connected and more coordinated. In addition, over time, emotion and memory areas and many other brain regions become interconnected with each other, which helps to explain why emotional arousal can affect how we remember things. It is the interconnection of neural networks within the brain that helps explain our complex human emotions, thoughts, and behavior. The brain is part of the nervous system. The system consists of the brain, spinal cord, and complex networks of neurons that extend throughout the body. The nervous system is responsible for sending, receiving, and interpreting information from all parts of the body. The system monitors and coordinates internal organ function and responds to changes in the external environment. The nervous system is made up of two parts, the central and the peripheral nervous system. As we stated on the last slide, the central nervous system is made up of the spinal cord and brain. 
The spinal cord receives information from the skin, joints, and muscles. It also carries all the nerve impulses that control all our movements. Via the spinal cord, the brain receives information from our eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, and the rest of the body. The brain then uses this information to send out instructions to the body about how to react. The peripheral nervous system is made up of the nerve fibers that branch off from the spinal cord and extend to all parts of the body. The autonomic nervous system is part of the peripheral nervous system. It regulates automatic body functions such as heart rate, digestion, and respiratory rate. One part of it is automatically activated when the brain senses stress, while the other is activated when we feel calm. The autonomic nervous system has two branches, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is activated when we experience stress. It is responsible for our fight, flight, and freeze reaction that requires us to increase our energy expenditure. It tells the body to be on alert and use energy and resources that make the heart beat faster signal the lungs to take in more air and shut down non-essential functions such as digestion and reproduction. For example, imagine how you feel when you can't find your keys and you're going to be late. Imagine for a baby when they drop their bottle or toy and can't see it. The parasympathetic nervous system helps to soothe the body and regain its equilibrium. It is activated when we feel calm. It signals the body to conserve energy or rest and digest. It slows the heart rate and breathing and relaxes to allow digestion, reproduction, and other systems to function again. The parasympathetic branch soothes the body and regulates body, bodily functions, especially essentially serving as a calm after the storm for the stressed brain and nervous system. For example, when you hear soothing music or you get a hug from someone you love, imagine for a toddler hearing their favorite song. You can see how these systems help us adapt and respond to our environment. This slide shows as a prenatal develops how different parts of the brain develop. We are now going to talk about these parts. The brain is divided into three major regions, hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain, which are then divided up into smaller regions. While the basic structure of the brain is present at birth, they are not fully mature. When the brain grows, it grows from the bottom up and from the back to the front. The hindbrain develops first, followed by the midbrain and the forebrain which is made up, up largely of the cerebrum. A good representation is your fist. Make a fist to illustrate the brain. You can use this to explain to parents about brain development. Let's start from the bottom up. The hindbrain is located at the base of the brain near the spine. It includes the cerebellum, pons, and the medulla oblongata. It is intact and well-developed at birth. The hindbrain is responsible for basic functions for human life. It controls breathing, heart rhythm, and blood sugar levels. The midbrain is located between the hindbrain and the forebrain. Its functions include eye movement, hearing, motor control, sleep and awake patterns, alertness, and temperature regulation. The midbrain and hindbrain together are often called the brainstem. You can think of the forebrain as resting on the brainstem. Without the functions of the brainstem, which are necessary for daily life, it would be very difficult to function in our day-to-day -day environment. The forebrain is the forward or front part of the brain. It begins to visibly emerge at five weeks in utero. Let's talk about the part of the forebrain called the cerebrum the largest part of the brain, which is responsible for higher order, more complex functions than our brainstem. 
including thinking, perceiving, planning, and processing language. Some of the most important areas of the cerebrum continue to develop into our mid-20s and life experiences continue to shape the way it functions far into adulthood. The outer layer of the cerebrum, the cerebral cortex, is the part of the brain we hear a lot about when it comes to brain development. Think of the cerebrum as an orange and the cerebral cortex as the peel of the orange. The cerebral cortex is divided up into four smaller regions called lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. The four lobes of the cerebral cortex are responsible for the important functions of processing cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and sensory information. The frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex is located at the very top front of the brain. Remember how we discussed that the brain developed from bottom up and back to front? This means that this is the last part of the brain to fully develop. In fact, this area of the brain experiences the most growth in thickness after birth through early adolescence, which is associated with the growth of cognitive abilities such as thinking, planning, and problem solving. Other functions of the frontal lobe include starting and coordinating motor movement, higher order cognitive skills, all necessary for executive functioning, and personality and emotional processing. The very front part of the frontal lobe is the prefrontal cortex and is considered the center for executive functions and is responsible for regulating thought, emotions, and actions. Because the prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to fully develop is one of the reasons adolescents are famous for their not so great decision-making skills. So with this in mind, as the last part of the brain to develop, what type of unrealistic expectations are we putting on young children to control their impulses and emotions? This is a video about executive functioning. Ever wonder why some children are well organized and have an easier time adapting to change than others? It's a result of how certain skills develop in our brains at a young age. Scientists call these skills executive function and self-regulation which can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead, cope with frustration, and follow lots of rules. When executive functioning skills are working well, they're invisible. It's not like you see them in action <laughs> because they enable children to be a good student, to be a good friend, to learn well. So they're just kind of hidden. It's really when they break down or when a child is really challenged by these capacities, hasn't, hasn't had a chance to develop them very well, that you see problems. Kids with well-developed executive function can deal with day-to-day -day worries, temptations, and obligations that pile up in their minds. They have the skills to regulate the flow of information and prioritize tasks. Executive function is one of the ways we manage stress and maintain an even keel, even as demands on our attention start to pile up. Kids who haven't developed strong executive function have a harder time directing mental traffic. Without the ability to prioritize, Thoughts pile up and collisions occur, leading to frustration and anxiety. First of all, we aren't born with executive functioning skills. Executive functioning skills are capacities that we learn. It's very important that children be in relatively pr predictable, unchaotic, uh, environments <laughs> that are free of toxic stress because when we are surrounded by chaos and disorganization and especially if we're surrounded by fear and anxiety and a world that feels threatening it's very hard for children to acquire these kinds of capacities like most skills 
good executive function depends on a strong brain foundation that develops in our earliest years of life. Caregivers can help by setting a good example with their own behavior, practicing serve and return interactions, and preventing toxic stress. As kids grow up through their preschool years and even into their teens, a stable, predictable environment will help them develop good executive function skills. Executive functioning skills can be trained and taught. You do not have to give up on a child <laughs> who has these problems. There are very sensitive periods during the ages from about two to five or six, and again during adolescence. Um, when these um, skills seem to be kind of growing by leaps and bounds. So you have a, a couple of opportunities and ideally do both. The human brain is an amazing thing. With practice, it can learn to pay attention, plan ahead, prioritize, and react to events as they unfold. Just like the air traffic control tower at our busy airport. With help from the community, kids can learn the skills they need to thrive in a challenging world. Parental lobes functions include sensory processing, such as knowing where your body is in space. Sensory processing is at work when a young toddler tries to avoid other children who are in her path to get to the block area. As the parietal lobe develops over time, children are better able to orient their bodies in an increasingly efficient way. Picture a preschool versus a high school soccer game. The preschoolers chase the ball and run into each other, falling to the ground. By the high school high schoolers seem to work effortlessly around each other. Another function is regulating attention or how well a person is able to tune in and focus on a thought or action. As the parietal lobe develops, so does a child's ability to attend for longer periods. A young infant may be able to sustain attention for just a few seconds, while a preschool can sustain attention if fully engaged for about 15 minutes. So I ask you to think about this. Are we putting unrealistic expectations on the kids we work with when we write outcomes around attention span? Should these outcomes instead focus on completing a task? The last function of the parietal lobe is language or being able to learn and recall words to communicate at appropriate times. A person with damage to their parietal lobe might experience challenges in calling words to mind or have difficulty speaking at all. Another sensory processing function of the parietal lobe is how we see print or objects in relation to another. A person with a problem in their visual processing system, such as dyslexia, perceives print in a different order on the page or screen than what others might see. The green brain sees letters in the correct order. The red brain illustrates what a child with dyslexia sees. I'm sure many of us know a child or an adult with this diagnosis. The function of the occipital lobe is to process visual information such as shapes and colors. When working with young children, we might notice a child who consistently incorrectly identifies colors. Their occipital lobe is processing visual information differently than other children. This condition is sometimes called color blindness. The temporal lobe has a variety of important functions that include processing auditory information, hearing different pitches of sound, language recognition, understanding what words mean, storing visual memory, such as remembering a familiar face, short and long-term memory through a structure called the hippocampus and emotional responses through a structure of the temporal lobe called the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for our fight, flight, and freeze responses and helps us to interpret our environment as dangerous or safe. It is often referred to as the panic button of the brain. Now we're going to talk about brain connectivity. This is how the nerve cells communicate with each other and make connections that form networks. So we talked earlier about how the brain grows in size and volume. The other way it grows is through connections made within the brain between the nerve cells or neurons. How does this growth of brain connections take place? Well, we know that the rate at which these connections are made is astounding. 
scientists estimate that the brain is making around 1 million new neural connections per second in the first few years of life. Neurons communicate or connect with one another by sending nerve impulses from one neuron to another, forming long chains. These chains eventually create complex networks. The more often the chain of neurons communicates or sends impulses to each other, the stronger the chain becomes, making faster and stronger networks that pass information between areas of the brain. Think about taking a walk in the woods. The first time you make a path, you have to step over brush, rocks, and branches in your way. The path is slow going, but the more frequently you take the same path, the easier and quicker the trip becomes. The same thing is happening in a baby's brain as new neural networks are formed and fire impulses along this chain over and over. So what this means for young children is that the experiences that young children have in the world stimulate their neurons to communicate with each other, forming connections. So the experiences we provide young children are literally helping to develop their brains. Let's look at a neuron, learn about its parts, and how it communicates with other neurons. At one end of the neuron is a cell body with hair-like extensions. These hair-like extensions are called dendrites. Their job is to be available to bring signals called neurotransmitters from neighboring cells. Once the dendrite receives the message from the neighboring cell, it triggers the cell body to create a nerve impulse, kind of like an electric current. This impulse travels down the long tail of the neuron, called the axon, to the other end of the neuron. At the other end of the neuron are axon terminals. These nerve impulses tell the axon terminals to release or not release little message packages, which are called neurotransmitters. To reach the next neuron, the neurotransmitters must cross a very tiny space called a synapse. The neurotransmitters cross the synapse to the dendrites of the next nerve cell. The neurotransmitters that one neuron sends to the next neuron tells it to either pass the impulse or message along to the next cell or stop there. The impulse or message travels most smoothly down the axon from the cell body of the axon terminal, which is insulated by a fatty material called the myelin sheath. The axon serves as a pathway. The myelin sheath keeps the impulse on the path so it doesn't escape and also helps the signal to move faster. The more insulated the axon is with the myelin sheath, the more accurately and quickly the message is sent. Think of it like a newly paved highway, making travel quicker and more efficient, allowing messages to make their way speedily without hitting a bump or veering off course from one neuron to the next. A newly paved highway accomplishes this much faster than traveling an old dirt road with potholes and covered in rocks. This is where gray and white matter come in. Gray matter makes up most of the parts of the neuron, except for the myelin sheath. White matter is the myelin. It gets its name from the white fatty cells it is made up of. The growth of gray matter peaks in early childhood, while the white matter continues to develop into early adulthood. The creation of connections between neurons is called synapsogenesis, or synapse formation. The neurons that communicate with each other more often form stronger connections across their synapses. Neurons need to connect with other neurons to perform a particular function, such as hearing or smelling something. These connections can cross short distances in the brain or very long distances across the brain, or longer distances from the brain down to the spinal cord. A developing neuron responds to neurotransmitters and other signals in the environment to help guide its path. Some neurons have specific functions. For example, the motor neuron in our bodies drive our muscles. As a child learns to crawl and walk, connections between the neurons in the brain, the motor neurons in the body, and the muscles they target strengthen and grow more efficient with practice. Other neurons, such as neurons in our eyes that sense light, 
or those in our nose that sense smell fine tune their connections based on the stimulation they receive from the environment. The same is true for neurons in the regions of the brain that process language and identify faces. As a child has experiences and receives sensory information from the environment, the brain fine tunes connections between neurons that help us learn a language or identify a familiar face. The more often a child has a particular experience, the stronger the connections will be in her brain. This is true for both positive and negative experiences. So if a child is greeted with eye contact and words when she coos, the connection in the brain that processes language are being strengthened. But if a baby is shout shouted at every time she cries, the connection in her brain that processes fear is strengthened, which means she is likely to expect to be shouted at and experience fear when she cries to communicate her needs. The experiences that children have affect the actual structure of their brain. So we can say that brains are built through experiences. What does it mean when we say the brain is more plastic in early childhood? It refers to the ability of the brain to modify itself to adapt to new experiences in the environment. Our brains have the greatest plasticity at the beginning of life and it decreases as we age. This means that a child's environment in the first few years of life has a very significant impact on how the brain develops and functions. Because infants are learning so much and establishing so many new connections between neurons, they have a great deal of flexibility or neuroplasticity in their brains. As we age, our brain doesn't make as many new connections. The plasticity of our brain is not as great as it was when we were children. This is the reason why it is so easy for children to learn new things, like a language. It is more difficult as an adult. Brain development unfolds in a hierarchy. This means that the networks that are forming in the brain begin with the most critical functions for survival in the world, such as seeing and hearing and then move to more complex functions such as math or complex problem solving. In general, there are two types of neuroplasticity. We will discuss both of these in the next few slides. Experience expectant neuroplasticity refers to the connections being made in the brain that form based on exposure to experiences that most people or animals would have in their environment. Normal brain growth and development require exposure to these experiences. For example, exposure to light through the eye is essential for developing vision. Experience-dependent neuroplasticity refers to the changes in the brain's connections that happen only if the child receives the environmental stimuli to build those connections. The brain takes these new experiences that some people may have, but not others. For example, children living in an agricultural farm community develop awareness of weather patterns and the responses of animals in ways that children growing up in urban environments do not. Or children who grow up in harsh, abusive homes learn to become vigilant to threat or danger in ways that children growing up in secure homes do not. Experience-dependent neuroplasticity is what allows us to learn and adapt in, to our environment. We can continue learning and adapting to our environment into adulthood. So we know that the timing for when a person is exposed to certain environmental stimuli can affect the development of neural connections. Scientists have identified that some areas of development have a window of time that closes more quickly called critical periods, while others stay open for longer called sensitive periods. Critical periods have more distinct windows of time when they start and stop. After that time period ends, the window of opportunity for that skill to develop closes. For example, newborn mice, mice must experience normal whisker sensation in the first few days of life or they will fail to develop normal sensitivity to touch 
in their faces. Sensitive periods begin and end more gradually and represent the optimal time for maximum change. Although change can occur after the sensitive period ends, it just requires more effort. Think back to learning a new language. It is easier for a young child than it is for an older child. Think back to taking a foreign language in middle school or high school. You could do it, but it just took a lot more effort on your part. Babies require normal visual input, or they may suffer permanent impairment. Children born with a lazy eye will fail to develop sharp vision and depth perception if the problem is not promptly corrected. Language skills depend on verbal input in the first few years of development of certain skills, particularly grammar and pronunciation. Without this input, language development may be permanently affected. The critical period for language learning begins around five years of age and ends around puberty. This is why individuals who learn a new language after puberty almost always speak it with a foreign accent. Different parts of the brain have different sensitive periods based on when those regions of the brain are developing and maturing. During the early months of life, sensory regions are being refined as a baby is flooded with new sensory experiences. Many new connections are forming between neurons in the sensory region of the brain and body. Following the peak of the synaptic development in the sensory regions of the brain, there is a period of great synaptic growth in the language region of the brain. Following this period of language development is an even longer period of development and higher cognitive functions, which extend well into the late teen years. During the critical and sensitive periods, a child experiences sensory, motor, emotional, and intellectual determine which of these synapses will be preserved. The least used connections are eliminated. Pruning is a process by which neural circuits are refined. Neural circuits and connections that fire more often are retained, while those that are not used are removed. Pruning allows brain circuits to run more efficiently. Early experiences affect the nature and quality of the brain's developing architecture by determining which circuits are retained and which are pruned through lack of use. In this way, each child's brain becomes better tuned to meet the challenges of his particular environment. Think back to that foreign language class you took in middle or high school. How many of you can still speak or read the language you learned? I took Spanish in high school. Today, I know some of the colors and can count to 10. These connections that I made taking Spanish were pruned away because I did not use them. So the term use it or lose it is true. So during the early years of brain development, the foundation for the architecture of the brain is being laid. It is solidified through the early experiences we provide for young children, which influences whether the brain's architecture will be strong or fragile. This is why researchers, researchers believe that early childhood, particularly the first few years of life, is a prime opportunity to positively influence the course of the person's life. So let's talk for a minute about a routine such as bedtime that many families participate in on a daily basis. Think of all the experiences the child is having, getting a bath or shower, brushing teeth, getting PJs on, putting clothes in the hamper, getting a final drink of water, snuggling in bed with the adult, reading books, etc. Now think of the feeling the child is having during these experiences, such as comforted, loved, independence, cared for, nurtured, etc. Think what is going on in the home environment. Lights are lowered, night light gets turned on in the room, soft music, noise machine may be turned on, maybe the temperature is lowered in the house, ceiling fan is on to help circulate the air, clattering of dishes of the adult finishing cleaning up in the kitchen downstairs, maybe older kids settling down also. Think of all the areas of the brain that might have been stimulated and all the connections that have been made during the bedtime routine. 
it has created quite a network from this one routine. We know that neurons that communicate with each other often form strong networks. Let's think about some of the experiences the child getting ready for bed had during the routine and what areas of the brain might have been stimulated to make connections. Think about what types of physical and sensory experiences the child had during the bedtime routine. Soft touches, cuddles, maybe hearing the adult heartbeat, feeling the cool water on their mouth as they brush their teeth, and the warm water of the bath. Now let's think about what areas of the brain might have been stimulated through these sensory experiences. Did the parietal and occipital lobe come to mind? We know that the forebrain, especially the parietal lobe, is involved in sensory processing, and the occipital lobe is involved in visual processing. When we think about the feelings this child is experiencing, what areas of the brain come to mind? Did you think about the temporal and frontal lobes or the parasympathetic nervous system that helps us be calm and relax? Lastly, what type of cues in the environment does this child associate with bedtime? The frontal lobe is stimulated by routines as it works to think and plan what comes next. Connections were made across areas of the brain that control senses, feelings, and thoughts. Wow, just during a bedtime routine, the child's brain is being stimulated to make many, many connections. Imagine how strong these connections will become if this bedtime routine happens every night. Over time, these networks become so strong that the child begins to self-soothe at bedtime or becomes more independent in carrying out some of the activities to get ready for bed. In this case of a very loving bedtime routine, the child would also likely associate positive feelings with going to bed. So what can we do as professionals? Understanding the parts of the brain and how they communicate with each other is all very interesting, but how do we apply this to the work we do with young children? One very important way we apply it is by setting realistic expectations for the children we work with and explaining these expectations to families. For example, based on the timing of the development of the frontal lobe, we would not expect a toddler to have the impulse control of a preschooler or kindergartner. Knowing that infants have rudimentary brain functions for attention, we wouldn't expect infants and toddlers to have a long attention span. We also must be keenly aware of the importance of our interactions with children we work with in the field of early intervention. We need to provide them with experiences that will help build the foundation of their brain architecture. They will build connections through their experiences with us that they will take on through adulthood. So let's review some of the key messages. The brain is not fully developed at birth. It grows in size and connectivity. The brain grows from back to front and from the bottom up. The brain stem in the lower back part of the brain develops first and is largely formed at birth giving us the ability to go through everyday functions. The forebrain in the upper front part of the brain is the last part of the brain to develop and is very plastic. It is shaped by experiences in early childhood and is responsible for higher order functions such as thinking, planning, problem solving, sensory processing, emotional regulation, and language development. We play a key role in providing children developmentally appropriate stimulation and responsive care to foster healthy brain growth in early childhood when the brain is most plastic. So let's make sure we covered all of our objectives of this training. We learn the parts of the brain and their functions. We understand how nerve cells communicate and connect, and we understand neuroplasticity and the role of early experiences in making connections between areas of the brain. Here are some references for this webinar. And here are some additional references from Zero to Three, the Growing Brain uh, training. Thank you for participating in this webinar. I hope it gave you some useful information about brain development, 
that will not only help you in working with young children, but also information that you can share with families. Please click on the arrow to the right to take you to the assessment for this webinar.